Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Financial Social Work free webinar, Helping Yourself and Your Clients Cope with Identity Theft. I see people are still arriving, but we are going to get started because we have such an exciting program for you. Exciting to the extent that you'll be a lot more knowledgeable after this session uh, than you are right now. At least that's how I felt because I thought I knew a lot about identity theft. But sadly, there is actually a lot more to know and we have a great person in Mary O'Brien to teach us about it. Um, I, I know she has some great informational slides, but as we got into this, she shared some stories with me and while they certainly are sad stories, um, if she shares them with you, you'll, you'll begin to understand the depth of how identity theft uh, impacts people's lives. I know it because my daughter-in-law's identity was stolen. And the sad truth is that all of us are very much at risk of having our identity stolen. So I will just say that Mary O'Brien is an MSW. She is the director of the National Identity Theft Victims Assistant Assistance Network. And then she can tell you a little more about herself when I pass the slides over to her. So just some housekeeping in the upper right hand corner. You will see um, that you can ask questions. You can keep those questions coming in. We will take them at the end. Um, you will also see that you can minimize that box if you want to see the whole slide. And you can also see that if I ask you any questions, you can use the question box also as an answer box. So today's agenda is the welcome, which we're doing right now. Um, then I'll tell you briefly about financial social work because we always average anywhere from 50 to a couple hundred new people at each webinar and we like them to know about financial social work um, and why we offer these free webinars. Then Mary will do most of this session on helping yourself and your clients cope with identity theft. Then just a slide on financial social work certification so that you can know what that is and then we will get on to the question and answer portion. We will have some raising of hands. I have just two polls for you today and we will do the Q&A at the end. So here's my first poll for you. Has anyone in the audience or someone you know or a client been a victim of identity theft. So let me open this poll. Um, polls. Okay. Um, and let's launch it. Okay. The votes are coming in. Obviously, you know, if I could vote, I would put that someone in my family had her identity stolen. Very interesting. 77% of you have voted. 78. Anybody else want to vote? All right. I'm going to. All right. We're up to 80%. I love it when it's 100 all right, I'm going to count it down and then I'll close it and share the results with you. So you still have five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. I'm going to close it and I'm going to share it with you. And you will see, very interestingly, the majority of you have had a client who's had his or her identity stolen. A quarter, a little over a quarter of you have not had anyone you know um, have his or her identity stolen. That's a good thing. Um, and 
I'm sorry for the 11% who have had theirs stolen. So I'm going to hide that and just share with you a little bit about the Center for Financial Social Work. Our mission is to help men and women begin the journey to sustainable long-term financial behavioral change. And our goal is to contribute to personal, professional, and financial change. Also social change. What makes financial social work so special? I believe it's our behavioral model. The financial behavioral model which incorporates ongoing financial engagement, education, motivation, validation, and support. And that's because I know that those are the components that everyone needs to create lasting change, especially with money. So it's highly experiential, very strengths-based, heavily psychosocial, interactive, introspective, and multidisciplinary. And what it looks like is the fact that it's your relationship with your money that drives your financial behavior. This means it's how you earn, spend, save, and share that actually determines your financial circumstances. And so all this talk about financial behavioral change is because that's what needs to happen until and unless behavior changes, nothing changes. And these are just a few of the organizations who have certified staff people. And I'm not going to stay on that. I think we have just this last poll before I turn it over to Mary. So let's do this one. Okay. I always love to know where our audience is. I'm going to launch that. I do know we have someone with us today from Nigeria, which I think is great and exciting. Last month we had someone from Canada. No, from South Africa also. Okay, so we have 2% of our people. All right. Oh, that's right. You can't see it yet. Usually it's fairly well um, spread out across the country, but we do have one area more significant represented than others. Okay, we have 86% of you have voted and I will count it down and then close it. Oh, we're up to 90% of you. Good. <laughs> Sorry, but this is the, only the, other, the second poll I have for you today. Usually we have more, but for today we have these two. So I'm going to go ahead and 93% of you voted. Anybody want to make it 100? No. Okay, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We'll close it. I'll share it. And the South is strongly rec um, uh, in attendance. The West, not so much. Okay, if you're from someplace else and you want to share that with us, um, go ahead and put it in the answer box or the question box. Um, while I turn this over to Mary. Mary, while I'm doing that, would you like to um, introduce yourself? Thanks, Rita. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that we have strong representation from the South because unfortunately, I have to say, there is quite a few identity theft victimization happening in Florida and Texas. So I'm sorry to those that, that clicked that box, but, um, but I'm really glad that you're on the call and, and to everybody. I'm, I'm, glad that, um, I'm glad to see so many social workers and, and probably other allied professionals on the call that know about this issue, uh, know that it matters to their clients. Um, so often I, I hear, um, uh, you know, I talk to social workers, lawyers, and, and legal clinics across the country, that sort of thing, who think initially, well, you know, I don't know if I see identity theft. It probably affects people with, you know, that have more larger bank accounts uh, to, um, to, you know, to take the identities of. And, um, and so often I, um, 
you know, I, I say, well, you know, do you see these types of consumer issues, or do you see um, somebody in a, you know, trying to leave a, a abusive situation, uh, dealing with um, their abuser, doing these types of financial crimes and that sort of thing. And then little by little, um, a lot of the social worker types I talk to uh, kind of say, well, you know what, I am seeing identity theft. We just called it different things. So, um, so it's very, it's, it's interesting. But yes, this issue definitely affects some of the clients that um, we social workers see in our lives, um, the, the folks, low-income folks, immigrants, definitely uh, homeless individuals, um, if you think about it, traveling around, don't have very secure paperwork, you know, being kept securely. Um, people, you know, we saw years ago after Katrina and other um, natural disasters and man-made disasters as well, you, you know, you see a lot of those folks becoming victimized or scammed after those. So, yeah, so a lot of the people that we see are indeed, um, unfortunately, identity theft victims. And it's great to see such a large group that, that gets that and, and wants to learn more about it. Um, so just to begin with our objectives, we could spend all week, <laughs> eight-hour days talking about this. And, and we might not still feel like we're experts in this issue. Um, but we just want to, you know, in, in this hour, um, kind of give a kind of give a snapshot of what's the impact on the victims and what does the data say about you know how often this is happening um, you know you know how big is the problem and what what how deep does the impact um, go um, to these victims and uh, and then you know um, understanding what the needs of the victims you might see are uh, and and then how you might be able to begin to help them even if in your work you're not going to take them all the way down that road. Um, uh, you know, even if you're pointing them in the direction and making them a solid referral, or and you know, and how, how to find out about those agencies that might help them in your community, and just needing to know that um, whether you're pointing uh, clients that can can and are able in, in their situations to do self help, how to point them towards that self help. Um, so just the beginning steps of of how to sort of help them, and certainly not make the situation worse, which. Unfortunately, a lot of helpers and, and folks in law enforcement that might encounter identity theft victims, you know, if we don't have training, a lot of times we, we might not know how to respond, and, and certainly we don't want to make it worse. Um, and then uh, lastly, we're just going to uh, give you a bunch of resources um, for those that have the time and ability to delve farther in this issue. I'd really encourage you to do so, um, and, uh, and I'll, I'll show you how to do that and where to go for that. So let me put to the next. Here, okay. So the part one, the first objective. Um, what what really is identity theft? What what does it encompass? And, um, and let's talk about the impact. So whenever I say, you know, I'm I'm, I'm at a party and I say what I do for a living, and somebody says, oh yeah, sure, identity theft. That's happened to me. Um, you know, but my bank called me right away, and before I even knew my card was out of my wallet, the bank called me, and you know, it was no big deal, really. You know, and uh, and I. You know, I don't want to bring down the mood of the party, so I might not say that there. But you know, really, I'm thinking, wow, you know, that that's just the the tip of the iceberg of what some of these larger, deeper types of identity theft are, um, and how they might impact the kind of clients we might see. Um, is definitely, you know, the the simple credit card um, fraud. You know, that's that's a very that's a very in a lot of cases easily fixable crime. Um, but when you talk about other types, and I'm going to put some of them up here. Um, medical identity theft. You know who who here has has you know heard of that and 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 hopefully nobody's encountered that. That is really very complicated. You know you've got HIPAA rules. Um, you know uh, in in terms your 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 actual criminal, the person who's perpetrated this on you, might actually you know their files um, that are intertwined with yours now become private. And in some cases, you know you can you. People tell you you can't have access to them, even though they're in your files. So there's there's all these issues with that, and that can really have you know physical damage to the to the victim. Really, and we'll talk about that. Child identity theft. Now that is in a lot of cases the perfect crime to perpetrate because the um, the person doing this knows that their victim might not know about the crime for years. So for for 18 years, they might be able to just really run rampant on this credit, and it might not it might go undiscovered. Um, and there's access to our children's identities through their schools, foster children, of course, their information, their social security numbers are just being passed around. I mean, as they go from home to home, the paperwork is out and about, and other people are seeing it, and, you know, it's, it's a lot of times loosey-goosey, so um, making sure that people that are working with foster care children 
know, you know, how to help people with, with child identity theft is a big deal. And and really, um, the the network that um, that I'll tell you more about that I that I work with uh, has done a lot to help to help that community. We we have um, a webinar I'll tell you about that uh, specifically to um, that speaks to the issue of foster care identity theft and and what resources are out there. There's there's trainings you can have access to if you're in the foster care system if you're working you know if you're a worker or or a foster care parent and that sort of thing or even a foster care child. Um, there's educational resources for for them as well. That kind of speak to that audience um, and at their at their level and that sort of thing um, to help to help with that issue because there's legislation that's been passed that you know foster care identities have to be screened when they leave the system and that's you know so workers need to know how to do that really how to help them recover um, senior identity theft now we all know that this is a big this is a big issue and whenever we talk about um, interfamilial types of identity theft you're dealing with a whole nother layer because you're thinking. You know, these this population might have barriers to reporting, right? They might, you know, for reasons of, of love or for reasons of just family dynamics that are pressuring them in some way, or a whole myriad of issues that might cause them to to not report to the to law enforcement or others the crime. And you know, if you don't report to law enforcement, in a lot of cases, you have less you you actually have less access to certain rights that we'll talk about um, than than if you do report. So that that's a whole another whole other issue. Um, and of course, we see as social workers, uh, you know, some some issues related to governmental, you know, related to identity theft, uh, tax identity theft, growing every year, every year, and uh, and that oftentimes somebody will will try to file for their return, and somebody else has filed for it and taken their money, and it might be a long time before they get they can remedy that whole process and get the proper return that they're expecting. And then of course, I mentioned domestic violence related identity theft. That and also stalking-related identity theft have their whole other dynamics because let's think about it. The motives are different in a lot of cases. Um, monetary gain might be a motive, yes, but in some of these cases, there's also a whole other slew of motives that might not be present in, say, a simple, you know, skimming case where the wait waitress um, double swipes your card and sells your card number and etc. And you know that that might be purely monetary motive. But when you're dealing with with um, DV related identity theft and when you're dealing with stalking, those two types whole different set of dynamics there. So this quote I'm just going to share with you was shared um, with me um, by Colorado Bureau of Investigations um, uh, advocate who who runs the 24/7 free hotline for identity theft victims um, out of CBI. Um, CBI uh, also runs um, the Identity Theft Advocacy Network of Colorado, which is um, one of the groups that's part of our national network, and they've done really got really done a lot for identity theft victims in their state and also beyond. Um, and, and you know, I'll tell you how to how to reach them and how to find out more if you're interested. But um, this is just kind of a snapshot, and it pertains a medical identity theft um, victim in in this case. And it just kind of gives you a brief thought into you know my original statement that you know credit card fraud. It's it's such a small potatoes when you talk when you're comparing it to some of these other sort of um, more impactful types. Um, and and in some cases, yes, somebody might have received the wrong blood type. Um, they might be told that their uh, that their limit um, is has already been exceeded for a certain because a certain procedure has already happened and and you know that so they you know how can you get that taken out because it's already you know or something like that, that has actually happened so um, in a lot of cases this can be a really scary thing. Um, so um, talk about some of the consequences of identity theft uh, and this kind of re also relates to you know how somebody might find out that they're an identity theft victim, unfortunately. Well, they might actually find out when they are pulled over for a routine type traffic stop, you know, speeding or something, and get arrested. There might have been a warrant out that they're, they're not aware of and, you know, is in somebody else's name. Um, and that sometimes happens with strangers, but that can also happen to family members using your identity and, and you're not aware of it. Uh, and of course, you know, you can find out when you apply for a job and they run a background check and, you know, that, that can get tangled up and maybe they don't even want to deal with the fact that you're an identity theft victim. Uh, they just, it's too suspicious, you, you lose that job and that, that happens all the time. Um, and and you, can, you can read the rest, but it, it, can, it can very much range uh, and it can be very costly. So what does the data tell us? Um, well, the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, does really, a really great job of periodically publishing uh, a, a 
the survey, and, and you can actually, if you're really a data lover, which I am, <laughs> we did a webinar recently, and I'll, I'll tell you how you can access that, that goes into great detail about the, the, the data, and it's very interesting. Um, and the folks who, who did the survey uh, were spoke on the webinar, and, and, and you can contact them with questions, and they're very knowledgeable. But it's very interesting because they, they have found that the, the financial cost is very, very large. Um, a lot of people are experiencing identity theft, so our survey in the beginning um, isn't really atypical at all, unfortunately, how many people have experienced it. And then in terms of the, we were talking again about the greater impact where a social worker may need to be of assistance to somebody, where it's not just as simple, the bank wipes the, you know, wipes the fees, you're fine, move on with your life, where we might actually come into contact with a client um, those cases, uh, three million people um, in the two-year period experienced those larger issues: utility cutoffs, being arrested, um, health records being all messed up. You know, they didn't even have these children that they're getting child support garnished from their paycheck for, et cetera. And that's actually happened. So, um, this this is this is happening to a lot of people. Um, these types of larger issues, and then you know the effect on the victims. So. Over half of victims are feeling moderate to severe distress, and that's defined in that um, justice statistics survey I, I was telling you about. Um, that they, they measure that for violent types of crimes, um, and they use the same sort of um, you know the same sort of um, you know metrics to, to measure those both and to kind of compare those. And um, and and in, and I'll show you in a second. Those those can often be comparable. The the, the two, you know, how how violated a person feels um, to some of the some of the violent types of assault and that sort of thing. Um, you know, divorce. That's a common that's a common thing that you that we hear about. Um, people really, you know, we'll we'll kind of talk a little bit more about this, but you know, suicidal. Yes, and and, and initially people might think, well, come on, it's it's just a financial crime. But when you really think about somebody not being able to get a job, you know, losing an opportunity to have a mortgage, uh, on and on and on. And this might be lifelong. It's not, oftentimes it's not just, oh, you know, there's a data breach. Oh, it's a simple thing. You, you know, you change your passwords on things, yada, yada, you move along. Um, in a lot of cases, once they have access to your information, let's say your Social Security number. In rare instances, the Social Security Administration will change, give, issue you a new Social Security number. But even then, that's not a foolproof uh, method. And also, some of the higher up Social Security numbers that are being issued, that the numbers, um, oftentimes banks won't re recognize them. So then you can't get, I, I know of a woman who is very frustrated. She, she can't get uh, any student loans and, and things like that. So her chances at continuing in her education are, have been affected, and, and her life has been on hold. And, and so these rippling effects are really you know, you can imagine that it really becomes so desperate over years and years and years. In some cases, the identity theft might be as cleaned up as it can be, but then years later, it pops up again. Because oftentimes, um, uh, the the data brokers and and there's people that actually specialize in different types of identity theft. Believe it or not, just like we in our jobs specialize in different types of social work, <laughs> these criminals are specializing in different types of identity theft, and so. Um, they, these data brokers are people that are that are you know sort of buying the data um, oftentimes from let's say a waitress who's skimming your card or that sort of thing and they have whole rings set up um, you know funding let's say some some meth rings you know this can this can finance um, meth rings or you know different types of drug cartels the mafia etc they can be tied up in more serious things and so if your identity is is stolen you know and these data brokers have it oftentimes they've sold it to multiple you know, multiple people and, and organizations. So later on in life, it could totally pop up again and you think you're done. So the, really the problem here is that, you know, there's low accountability for the offenders, oftentimes no charges, never caught, et cetera. Um, and you can just keep getting hit again and again by oftentimes the same people, different people. You, you never know when it's going to come back. So you can imagine the paranoia and the sort, sort of just anxiety that can cause in these, in these uh, really tough cases. So I mentioned this before, the BJS survey, um, moderately distressing, severely distressing. Um, and you know, so you can see 29% violent crime victims um, and 20% of identity theft um, victims. So comparable numbers, really. And, and you know, and that, that feeling of violation is just, you know, and, and the ongoing aspect of it, rather than the one-time stranger assault type, type situation, you can see how it might how it might actually stack up this way. 
and this is another quote um, that CBI shared with us. Um, and, and and you know, think about the no-fly list. You know, this person was on the no-fly list, and you know, uh, for, through no fault of their own, um, they were an identity theft victim. And and the person who's using their identity is is really into some bad things. And so that could, you know, they they really don't even want to fly anymore, and so their business is affected. So you can you can see that emotion come through in that in that it's it's uh, pretty bad. Um, and then, you know, think about the typical trauma response you'd see in uh, victims of other types of crimes. A lot of us know, you know, sort of know what trauma might look like. And, you know, I've, I've, um, I've heard stories, uh, you know, I, I know a woman who, who moved around many times as a child because her family's identity was stolen. And, um, in fact, security, security gates were installed around her home. And her, her parents, just the paranoia was there. And it was real. And, you know, they, they had a reason to, to feel that way because they were constantly, you know, um, worrying. And, of course, they, they um, considered divorce. Uh, they um, suspected family members of, of doing this and friends, so they cut off ties to family members and friends because uh, in their situation, who could have accessed all this personal information So um, of, of all of them? So, you know, there, there can really be a, just a change in, in a person's whole life uh, through this. And of course, it's worse too when when the people who are supposed to help react in less than helpful or even hurtful ways, and then that can really make your, you know, make you question um, the response in, in general uh, to you. You know, there's there's this there's this thought of you know, is there is there justice for me? There might be justice for other victims. What about what about me? You know. Um, uh, some of us on the call may have seen a uh, Lifetime movie about identity theft based on a true story, um, where a woman, uh, you know, she she traveled and she was, a, you know, detained at the airport. She wasn't able to get a mortgage. Um, all these things happened, um, and and in her case, the person was finally arrested. Finally arrested, but through a um, technical error or a paperwork error when when her perpetrator was being uh, jailed. The perpetrator used her name during the processing of being, and I know it almost sounds funny if it wasn't so sad that this could actually happen, but in the, in the arrest for identity theft, the, the identity thief used her name during processing through the jail system and was actually served time as her and, and all of this. And so, it, in fact, she was victimized, this victim was victimized through the justice system, actually, because this person now had created a... Um, you know, a uh, criminal record in her name. So if you just think about that, it just, it's mind blowing. You know, um, that, that this can, you know, that this can be so so deep for somebody. Uh, and like I said, it's a high reward, low low um, fear of, of you know uh, prosecution crime. So you know, there's often limits for the amount of money somebody can steal. But for some people, you know. Um, a small amount of money is to one person. Large amount it means more to another person. So you know it, that scale is, is often is meaningless to, to especially the people that we might we might be helping that are low income. And and this just brings me to again that the helpers in the system might not be a support. They might actually be a hindrance or a, a revictimization. You know, sort of agent. So. Uh, so, but there's, on the happy note, um, I want to say uh, the part two is how we can be an actual positive response. <laughs> so how we can um, provide for that victim, um, you know, a, a very positive, helpful response to them. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The, the good news here is a lot of the advocacy skills you currently use with clients, you, can, you, you already know, you can use here as well. So listening, you know, the skills that you have there. Um, you might be the first person to hear what the system is saying, or you might be in a, a long line of, of people that has, you know, sort of passed this case through. And they might be, you know, very frustrated at this point, having to repeat themselves again and again. So you never know where you're coming in the process. And, and making sure that you are a good listener can really mean a lot. Because in a lot of cases, yes, there's not going to be any response through, through the actual justice system. The case might not be pursued and, and in, in many cases. Um, so being that listening ear might be the biggest you know, relief for this victim actually might be you and your response. Um, so if you consider that, it, it makes it very powerful. Um, and then remember, this seems simple, but just remember not to blame the victim, you know, for 
for having their information loose or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. We oftentimes do that, oh, make sure these tips for how you, instead put the blame on the perpetrator because that, you know, that's where the blame really, really belongs. And, um, and making sure that they know that, um, you know, many victims are, are going through, through this and, and many are experiencing some of the deeper feelings that they're experiencing that they're not, you know, crazy for feeling this way. So the first thing you want to do is, is see how deep the crime has gone. So, you know, just keep in mind, you know, we talk about co comorbidity of other types of, you know, victimizations. Um, with identity theft, one form might indicate that there's other forms present. Unfortunately, I spoke of the data brokers and, and how that works. Um, you know, a lot of times, a smaller, you might just think there's a small data breach, but in fact, later on down the line, there might be, you know, other things that are happening and, and similar to this. So. Also, um, knowing about jurisdictional lines. So is the crime limited um, or, you know, does it cross lines? And there's a lot of confusion with victims and, and you know, even with advocates as to do the, does the police you know, department in their area have to take a report or is it where the crime occurred? Because a lot of times identity theft, it could be five states away or more. And the victim shouldn't be expected to have to travel five states to file a report or do what they need to do with that. So. Um, to answer that question that I often get, we have developed, and I'll, I'll tell you later in the presentation how to get to it, we've developed a resource map where victims and, and advocates as well can go to the map, click on the state, and see the legislation, the rules um, for whether the police department has to take the report, you know, exactly what your, your laws say in your area. And then you can, you know, work on educating the, the police on that and, um, and, and so that people know more about Because oftentimes there's misinformation as well out there. So knowing, knowing about the, the jurisdiction, you know, and the rules in your area really, really helps. Um, and, uh, you know, also assessing the client's um, ability to be able to, to do self-help. Uh, because in a lot of cases, this, this type of crime, there's, there's going to be a lot of paperwork involved, a lot of organization involved. Um, and, and keeping you know all track of all of that. So again, just do no harm, you know. Um, so educate yourself, and, and you know this is of course it's great. All the people that are on the call are preaching to the choir, but you know get get your colleagues to, to realize you know educating themselves. Um, these crimes are so widespread. Uh, really, it's important to be knowledgeable so you don't do more harm. Um, and also just knowledgeable, like I said, on referrals, being able to you know, know what you don't know and then pass that person on to somebody who might. Um, and then finally, a, lo a lot of times, some, some folks that might be new to this might think, oh, yeah, the first thing you need to do is patch up the credit history. Well, where in fact, um, we'll talk about this in the next slide, there's, there might be a myriad of issues involved that might be much more pressing than credit history. So what is involved? Uh, in some cases, and this is just a small, very small list, <laughs> unfortunately, there, there can be quite a lot involved. So just to give you, just to give you a thought about this, um, beyond credit histories, student loans, mugshot photos, insurance claims, um, medical records, you know, there could be warrants, employment history, driving, you know, on and on and on. Um, all of these things might be, might be things that need to be looked at. And some, in some cases of identity theft, become much more important than other, other things in, in the immediate. So what's your basic strategy? Um, and, I, and this is a very, like I said, a snapshot, very brief overview. And, and then I'll give you tools to find out more and to get more training on it. But your basic strategy is you want to stop the imposter's actions as quickly as you can. You want to be able to, to, to hinder that. Then you want to report the crime. You want to repair the damage. And then, unfortunately, you prepare for the re-victimization that is, in many cases, um, going to come. And you can give them tips on how to do that. So let's talk about those first steps. Uh, so when we're talking about Close, we're talking about stopping the imposter activity. We're talking about closing as many accounts that, that might be out, um, new accounts, uh, that sort of thing, reporting the crime to law enforcement. And I talked about you know, whether that be the, the law enforcement where the person lives, the jurisdiction um, where the crime occurred, that sort of thing. And, and we'll talk later about you know, how to find out what that is in your area. Um, and then completing the FTC affidavit. So um, some of you on the call might have heard about this. It's, it's optional, but it can be very helpful. It especially can be helpful to local law enforcement that are looking for large rings of identity theft. In many cases I've seen, 
this database provides information to the local law enforcement that they can then see a pattern developing and, um, and actually bust large rings of identity theft. And there are very organized, um, unfortunately, rings of identity. And I mentioned the specialists, and there can be ringleaders that they are very well organized in what they do. So that can really help out. The FTC affidavit can also, in some cases, provide the victim with more rights. Um, if they are having trouble getting the report from law enforcement, uh, the affidavit can, can really help them help them out. It also can help organize them so that uh, all of their, they might have so many papers related to this identity theft. And the affidavit provides the victim with a very easy, quick um, paper that document that, that, that sort of spits out after they, they, they work through this whole form online. Uh, that spits out, that provides them a very comprehensive, well-organized document that they can then present to law enforcement. And maybe it'll be easier for them to get a report, or they can just have in their little folder that they, they need to take when they're resolving all of these issues, take to the various places um, to close their accounts and that sort of thing. Um, so the FTC affidavit, I'll talk about how to find that online, but it's, it's a very easy thing. You can help a client of yours um, apply for it. So if they call you or they come into your office as a social worker, you can there's a there's an option to to help somebody else apply, you know, to get this to do this affidavit, or the the client themselves can call. There's a toll free number, and FTC operators are available and can walk them through it and then mail them the affidavit at the end. Uh, and I, I would strongly recommend that. It's it's very helpful. And you can you can see the other ones here. There's there's a myriad of things. Um, and to just to go on, you know, to give you just a brief snapshot of all the things that could be involved there. Um, responding to collections actions, uh, court records, um, warrants, foreclosures that might be on their history, um, placing the fraud alert or the freeze with the uh, credit reporting agencies. That's the CRA you see there. We could we could really get into much more about this, and I'll point you instead into resources to help you learn more about that. But those can be very helpful. Um, they're not a catch-all, you know, complete remedy for the situation, but they can be helpful for for slowing down the, the, the bleeding, basically. Um, think about military histories, school records, um, fraudulent child support actions, uh, all of this. And then replacing the documents um, that, that may have been stolen, so in those cases where, where they were stolen. Social networking sites, and, and that, that relates, oh, I talked before about stalking-related identity theft. Oftentimes, that's, that's a whole issue that is very, um, complex and can be very difficult to to, re to receive help um, from law enforcement and other people to to help on it. You know, um, it's it's a, it can be a very tangled tangled situation. So um, as you go forward, reminding the victims to keep all of the paperwork, um, keep it in a very secure, easy to access location, keep it well organized, uh, and often that is a challenge, um, but to the best of their ability, being able to keep everything in a folder, and often that can be an empowering process to, to be able to sort of tackle that and, and, and that there's a step forward. Um, that, can, that can actually be therapeutic for some people. And um, encouraging victims to keep detailed notes. In some areas, uh, there can be, um, you know, they can, they can spend just you know, hours and hours and hours uh, remedying this crime, and in some areas, um, seeking um, uh, seeking redress uh, through um, victim compensation and that sort of thing. So, making sure that they're documenting time missed from work and, and all of that is very important. So, just just to know, um, just some tips for you. Uh, you can really get a lot of support by um, working with other organizations and agencies, and that's really what I through the network am, am promoting, is the idea that together we can, we can tackle this much better than in our own silos. <clears throat> so um, finding out the agencies and organizations near you and also nationally that can help you um, will really cut out the time, the time that, it, that it takes to help these victims. So working collaboratively, that's, that is a good lead into the last part of the presentation. Um, Let's see how I'm doing on time. You're great on time. Um, no problem. Great on time? OK, good, good, good. OK. Um, so OK, so I mentioned, um, uh, we mentioned a little bit about the network. And I'll just kind of, um, we are a great first stop for resources on identity theft um, in your area. And uh, we, in, the, in the places that you see these little, these little logos at the bottom of the screen, um, we have coalitions, but also 
um, I mentioned the resource map, and um, there are resources all across the country that can help victims of identity theft. Not as strong a network as you know as we'd like. Um, we'd like to see more resources, of course, for victims, more knowledge on the subject, and so on. Um, but I can help you um, through through our national page, point you in the right direction um, to find the folks in in your area that can help. Um, and so, um, really, the first the first uh, thing you'd, you'd want is our main link there, um, identitytheftnetwork.org. Uh, we also post a lot about news and our upcoming webinars, um, our appearance on this webinar, for instance. And uh, also, next week, we'll be doing an Office for Victims of Crime web forum uh, where you can ask questions. So if you want to take this to the next step and really learn how to um, start a multidisciplinary group in your area, you can come onto that forum. And then, of course, you can always just contact me anytime as well, and, and I'll have my contact information up um, through, through any of these ways, really. You can get a hold of us and, and find out more. Um, but we, we really started um, through an Office for Victims of Crime funding stream a number of years ago uh, that, that sought to build these coalitions with the basic idea, again, that, that we work better when we, we work together. So law enforcement coming together with social workers, coming together with legal assistance agencies, and so on, uh, to really pool our resources to help these victims who really weren't, weren't being assisted. We're getting the runaround. Um, we're sometimes not getting the identity theft report they seek or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so the coalitions, and these are a few snapshots of their trainings and their meetings here below, um, but the coalitions really have three, three main purposes, raising awareness in their community of the problem, educating the law enforcement officers, the social workers, legal service providers, and so on in their area. And I mentioned the foster care workers. Um, so some of them took on very specific projects of education, too, um, when they saw a need in their community. And then just improving the you know, systems change level. In our agency infrastructure, developing MOUs for how to help the victims, and, and giving good referrals. So it wasn't just a, a run around, a pat, you know, passing around, but good, good referrals. Um, so this is our website here. And we have a news feed. We kind of post um, what's going on in the world of identity theft. You can subscribe to learn. You know, when we post new things on the site, you'll get that. Um, I mentioned the resource map, so you can see that um, over to the right there. Uh, and that, when you click on that, um, you'll see a whole map of the U.S. It's, it's interactive. It's clickable. You can click on every state. You can see um, the, the numbers that victims can call in their area for legal assistance. You can see um, uh, online forms that can help them that we'll talk about in a second. You can see all of the laws that relate to identity theft, um, either directly about identity theft or tangentially about security breaches and that sort of thing in their area. Um, so that, that is very well used on the site. <laughs> um, and you can also um, see there, there's a get help button. And that, that is, speaks directly to victims. So that part of the site um, speaks to, uh, if you click on that drop down, you'll see there um, help for domestic violence um, victims who are victims of identity theft, help for seniors who are help for children, um, tax related identity theft, so on and so on. So they're all grouped by different types of identity theft that people might encounter and specific steps and resources for them. Um, so you can print those pages. You can you know, feel free to reuse them. You can copy and paste and make it into your, your own materials. Um, all of this, take it and make it your own. Um, it's, it's all been federally funded and it's shareable. You know, it's it's um, perfectly, perfectly shareable. And then you'll see in the middle there, Toolkit for Professionals. And that is, um, we, we basically Basically, the 10 coalitions around the country, as they developed materials, they um, added to this toolkit. So they might develop a roll call training for, for law enforcement on identity theft. We, you know, they might add that. They've developed a, a you know, more lengthy training for a certain type of, of group. Um, that all the PowerPoint slides, uh, you know, maybe a recording of the training, uh, speaker notes, all are there, including actually a um, eight-hour general train the trainers sort of overview on identity theft, so that if you and your community wanted to give a long training and, and you know, become adept at that and, and bring that training to your community, you can download all of that and, and access that. So, and again, contact me if you want to, if you want to talk more about it. Of course, I love talking about it. So, <laughs> I mentioned um, we also, we have a YouTube channel and, and you can access that through the Identity Theft Network. Um, dot org site, uh, you'll see a little link to YouTube, and you can see all of our recorded webinars in the past, various topics, and there's a snapshot of, of what you see there. Um, and we, we bring on national experts, so oftentimes I host, and then we have, um, for instance, the person that coined the term medical identity theft, um, 
Uh, she's, she's the first person to coin the term, and she, she was on the webinar. Um, we have uh, people from FTC. Um, we have um, uh, people who worked with the, you know, uh, with the disaster-related identity theft, people who worked in the tornado regions um, that had to experience a lot of that um, came and spoke. So there were some really interesting topics here. And then again, a little, just a little bit about the toolkit. I mentioned some of these, but um, all the goodies that you can kind of find in there. Um, and again, the, the, the resource map, so all the things that you might see there. Um, a lot of states uh, do have a mandatory police report law for identity theft victims, so the details of that would be on the, on the map that they click on. Um, whether or not uh, identity theft is included in the state's restitution guidelines, so whether victims can seek financial restitution uh, if they're victims of financial crimes, that would be there as well. Um, whether they have an identity theft passport law, that's, that's kind of an interesting way of identifying an identity theft victim so that if they are pulled over, let's say, in a traffic stop, they can present that and that they are a victim and that they won't, you know, they won't be um, re-victimized, essentially, uh, is, is the hope. Um, and then, like I said, related laws, civil suits, security breach laws, anything that might be sort of related to this issue also, we, we tried to put there. Um, and another thing I want to note, if you on this call are listening to this and you have resources that you'd like to see added, you know that your agency has some special training in this or, you know, is willing, just willing to assist these victims and would like, you know, um, know, you know, knows about resources, your sister organizations, that sort of thing, it really should be listed on here, please, definitely um, uh, email me, let me know, and, and we'll, we'll um, work on getting those added and, and talk to those folks. We'd love that. And then also another thing, let me go back real quick. Um, we also have on this resource map, um, most of the states in the Union, save for, for a few, um, as well as some territories, have online, we've, we've kind of worked with them to get them to have online on their legal assistance websites forms that are interactive forms that take victims through a process of um, letting their credit uh, reporting agency know that they've been a victim, disputing charges on a bill, that sort of thing. Um, we've, we've worked so that they're, they're they're easy forms so that they, they kind of go through this process. A cartoon woman, which I'll show you here, walks them down the road to justice, sort of, and um, at the end, a letter can print out that they can then mail in to their um, credit reporting agency or the bill, you know, bill cross collector, that sort of thing. Um, so that you can also see if your state has one by going onto the resource map. And if it does, you'll see the link um, that says online, free online forms for victims. And it's, it's all done through, through nonprofit legal assistance agencies in their community. Um, so, but we are a bit beyond end all for any of I mean. So let me tell you about some of the other good resources out there. Just take a few more slides to let you know. Um, NCDC, the National Center for Victims of Crime, many of you on the call may have heard of that. Uh, partnered up with the FINRA Investor Education Foundation. Um, so FINRA and NCDC uh, got a whole lot of us together in a room that work around these issues, around a round table. We discussed what needed to be in an advocate guide to assisting victims of financial fraud. And that includes all different types of financial fraud. Um, and I contributed a lot to the identity theft action um, step chapter of this guide, as well as a lot of other people too, you know, what, what, needed, to, what needed to be, you know, um, told to, to advocates to get them in the, in the you know, the first steps so that they, need, they might need for, for these victims. It's a great guide, and if you're interested in identity theft, you're probably interested in other types of financial fraud too. Uh, it's well, well thought out, well organized, simple, not too much, not too little information. Beautiful, and it's all free, so you can order it um, through NCDC's website, and you, you can just Google NCDC. They also have a um, new center there. After launching the guide, they have actually launched a new center there. They've previously had sexual assault, um, or sorry, stalking center there, um, various other crime types at, at NCDC, and they now have a financial crime victim center there that that is going to really focus on on these financial um, issues, and that so that's very exciting. Um, so you can find out all about that online. They have good information there. Um, and then also, if you would like to receive um, a 40-hour in-depth interactive um, training on identity theft on how to assist these, these victims that you, you might see as clients in your practices, um, you can go online and, and sign up for the, for the Office for Victims of Crime training. This was developed a, a number of years ago, about five years ago, I, I think, about. And, um, 
it's great. It even um, has you react to the client and provides feedback on how you know on how on how you've done on that. There's there's you know a test as you go along. And again, it's a 40-hour training, so this is something where perhaps you could you know get your supervisor to you know allow you to go through this and perhaps to enhance your your skills and your ability to help these victims. And then you know spend spend a week on it. You can do it in chunks too, though. Um, but I, it is a lot of time, but it's very it's a valuable in, investment in, in your education. So and it's free as well. So um, OBC also has quite a lot on their website for identity theft, um, a lot of links and, and things like that. They have a an EPUB they call it, an um, electronic publication all on identity theft with a lot of good resources there. So their website is always good to check out for all different types of crime victims. Um, and then FPC is also um, the other go-to site for wonderful information, mainly consumer-facing information, but also other types too. Um, but the type of information where you can, for free, they, they don't mind at all, you can co-brand your agency. So let's say you work at a domestic violence shelter, you can go ahead and slap on your label or your logo onto next to their, their logo and then send that stuff out to the clients with your local phone number, that sort of thing. Um, and they, they continuously make very glossy, beautiful, well thought out um, consumer type um, brochures and things like that. So on identity theft, other types of financial fraud um, for, those, for those victims. And it, it's very helpful. And you can order all of that. Um, they can send you, uh, you know, there's bulk order available. Um, and you can also just feel free to copy from their website too. They have no restrictions on that either. So you can download the brochures, make your own copies, or like I said, just you know, it's free to bulk order supplies for your community. In fact, they have a really nice thing, the guide to assisting victims of identity theft. Um, it's kind of like MCDC's guide, but it, instead it's in depth just on identity theft, not all types of finan uh, financial fraud. Um, so, so that's so that's really great, and that often is geared towards lawyers. It's um, so if you have legal assistance providers in your community, um, or if you like myself worked um, for many years, I worked at a legal assistance agency. A lot of us social workers and, and uh, attorneys hand in hand there. So if you're in that type of setting, get these guides to your attorneys. Um, they'll they'll really appreciate them. Uh, and then there's also there a taking charge booklet, and it's um, you can see there the free resources link. That's where you click on that and you can find that. And taking charge booklet is for you to hand out directly to victims of identity theft. Um, and that uh, has forms in it, um, you know, fill in the blank where they can sort of collate all of their information in one spot, keep it organized, and that sort of thing. And I mentioned before, the Federal Trade Commission also is the one that has the online or via phone affidavit process where you can call or go online, fill out in this interactive way, you can fill out a form. And at the end, spits out a very well-organized um, takeaway that the, that the person can print or have mailed to them if they're on the phone. And then they can take that to their police department if they're having trouble getting their report. And it, it provides all the information for the officer in a very concise way. Um, there's also great videos there, too. So I highlighted those. And that's, that's what I've got. So I'm, um, I'm going to work on turning this back over here. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, Mary, thank you so much. Um, everyone on this end, um, uh, on the comments, um, had lots of good things and much appreciation for everything you were sharing. I am trying to get up my slides. Um, I want to show my screen, but not until I get up my slides. Okay, show my screen. A couple of people shared that they are currently going through trying to cope with uh, identity theft and, and found this particularly helpful. Um, you did such a terrific job. I've never seen so few questions. We have only one question, but um, if you have a question, go ahead and and send it over. I will um, finish up my part by talking about the Financial Social Work Certification, which some of our graduates are on this call. It is five workbooks. It is self-paced, self-study. It's all done online. Um, our students have six months to complete it, and there is an online final exam that students have two weeks to finish. And the cost is $495, and it, whoops, it includes 
um, 20 CEs from the National Association of Social Work. So now I will go to the Q&A and let's see. Um, okay, here's another question. So, okay, the questions are coming in now. Um, does it matter how long ago the identity theft was done for you to file a report with the police department? Hmm, good question. Um, you know, it, 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 I think it varies by jurisdiction. Um, but I don't believe that there's a, a limit on when you can when you can file an affidavit with the FTC federally. Uh, I think it you know no matter when it when it happens you can do that and um, we can kind of you know go into more depth with this. Um, feel free to give my my email and contact information out. Um, but uh, if you if you are if you aren't able to get that police report, you can still have certain rights um, through through filing that affidavit. And just in general, you, you can still have certain rights afforded to you as a victim. Um, so there, there's ways to kind of get around that, to, you know, depending on. Um, and, you know, also disputing errors on your, on your credit report and the rights you have as a consumer to do that and the rights you have as an identity theft victim to do that. Um, oftentimes, it, it can be years before, you real, you know, before a person realizes they've been victimized by this crime. So that's quite common. Um, so, you know, having you still have those access to those rights and the ability to, to dispute and, um, and the ability to have credit freezes and, and all of those sorts of things that, um, that we could you know, talk more in depth about uh, another time. So yeah, um, so it, it's not the end of the road if you, if you can't get that police report for various reasons. Um, the one, one question that for me um, that comes in very frequently and I usually address up front but forgot to is that um, we don't share the slides, but we do share the recording. That should be on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and our blog by the beginning of the week. So this was recorded. Um, okay. Would you advise to put a freeze on one's credit as a preventative measure, Mary? Hmm. I guess it depends, you know, per per person. Um, you know, it, it, it does add a diff, sort of a, um, you know, a more whenever you do whenever you do go and let's say try to get a, a, a car loan or that sort of thing. You know, the process of um, of, of thawing out the you know of thawing out the credit um, it does add more layers, I guess. Um, but really, the you know you got to think about also you know there's no fail safe, right? So. Um, security freezes are really just to prevent um, the the CRAs, um, the credit reporting agencies, from you know showing your credit report to somebody without you you know explicitly saying okay this car company can see it. So let's say your imposter goes out and tries to get a car in your name, um, and he you know provides the information and and he's used to being able to do that, and then you you put the freeze on, so boom he runs into that bear. There's a freeze. And he doesn't have the special password to lift the freeze for that purpose. Um, you know, then then he's blocked there. But there's so many ways that um, an identity thief can use your information that that doesn't require a credit check. Um, you know, so that, for instance, medical identity theft, or you know, criminal types of identity theft, or sometimes even opening um, certain types of accounts don't require a credit check. So maybe in some places they do, like the heat bill or the white bill, some, some places they do, but some places they don't. So just remember it's not a be-all and end-all, and it can be kind of an extensive sort of hassle um, for, for some people. But um, in some situations, especially if you've already been victimized, it can be pretty helpful. Um, so, you know, it, it really... It really depends, I think, you know, on on, on the situation, I guess. But I, I would, I wouldn't, I, w I definitely wouldn't say let you know everybody should consider it. <laughs> you know, that I think that is way too far. So that's my understanding. Um, th that has been my understanding, uh, not to just do that across the board. So our last question is one that I'm very reluctant to ask. Um, because I don't really think there's an answer. About how long does it take a person to clear their record by years? Oh, 
Yeah, gosh, that really, <laughs> that really is a hard one because it just, again, it just really depends on the type of identity theft. Um, in, in, in a lot of cases, it truly is a lifelong battle um, because, you know, you can't put Pandora back in the box or whatever you, you know, whatever the, the thing is. Once the, the, yeah, the rabbit's gotten out of the box, it's out. Um, once the person has your information, they, it can be used again and again, you know. So um, really, it does depend. Um, Especially, I mean, I mentioned briefly, like, for instance, some people say, oh, well, the, the end solution should be the Social Security Administration should issue all new Social Security numbers to everybody who, you know, this happens to. Um, and it's easy to say that and think, oh, that doesn't sound like a good idea. But in, in fact, it often creates quite a few more additional problems, um, I, you know. So that's not necessarily a be-all and end-all either. Um, but yeah, so once once your info is out there, it's just hard to put that back in, into that box. Um, and it can happen again and again. And it can, you know, if nefarious types, like let's say a meth ring has gotten a hold of, you know, yeah, those nefarious types are often people who are going to sell it again and again. And, and you know, um, so the price per identity can, can definitely, you know, on the, on the black market. It's, it's very interesting to see how these data brokers sell it. And, and so once it's out, it's out. Um, oftentimes, you know, police will, will raid, like, um, you know, sort of boiler rooms where people are making calls to scam elderly, for instance, and then you know they'll they'll see lists that have been purchased of of seniors, people over a certain age. Their um, you know their their name will be on the list, and once their name's on the list, they're often going to be you know they find you know you can call these seniors and say beware because your your name has been found in one of these raids, and you'll probably be called and tried to be scammed again. You know so. Um, we just know that it's often it's often repeat, especially true when it's a family member offense. So, you know, that can be especially challenging for a variety of reasons, especially if the victim can't or, um, you know, for various reasons doesn't want to be, you know, reporting that family pressure or a whole lot of reasons, you know. Um, so that, that can cause, you know, repeat situations. Um, oftentimes children don't want to report that their parents have stolen their identities, you know. Um, or they feel for them, or they're, you know, they, there's there's a lot of reasoning behind that, or or they did feel like they they had their best interest to keep the lights on, you know, and in mind, but it didn't didn't turn out well. So, you know, in those cases, oftentimes it can it can be repeat in families. Um, so that yeah, so I would say that's the toughest part of this crime. That oftentimes it just doesn't stop, and and you feel violated again and again. You know, you think, well, geez, this person is you know, has all this information about me and in case of strangers and I know nothing about them. You know, they know my they know all my things about my life, um, and I, I know I don't even know their name. And that sort of power in in inequity can really cause a feeling of violation that's unrivaled, I think, and you know, it's hard to understand until until you've been there. Um so but yeah, that's that that's the hardest part of it. It, it can be lifelong. <laughs> so well, I don't really want to end this on such a downer, um, <laughs> negative note. It is a problem. That's for real. But I'm most appreciative of all of the resources you provided for the financial social work community today, Mary. Um, you did such a great job, and uh, I have a lot of people writing in to thank you. And I want to thank. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. I appreciate everybody's enthusiasm being here and caring about this issue. And again, feel free to give my contact info if there's questions people think of. You know, days later, they can um, definitely give me an email. So, love to hear from them. Thank well, you. Well, th oh, thank you so much for an excellent webinar. Thank you, very informative. Thank you for a great webinar. Excellent information most informative, everybody. One person wrote that, um, that, it, that all of our webinars are interesting, but this one was great. So thank you. Oh, she, they want your contact information. Do you want me to share it if, if people email me? Is that it? Um, yeah, sure. That would be, that would be fine. Um, also, if people, people want to email, um, uh, they, they can do so. Um, uh, in, you can uh, M E R R Y at symbol um, M D Crime Victims dot org, uh, and that's the best way to get a hold of me. Um, 
And you can also I, also um, get me at, uh, you'll see on the website um, at nhsnetwork.org, you'll see a, a way to contact that way too and the email on there. Um, and, and I also receive those as info at identitytheftnetwork.org. That's a great way too. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. Mary, thanks for all of this. And everybody, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now.